We'll be hosting a Twitter chat on March 30th at noon, where we'll be reviewing some of the questions asked during the event today. And I uh, would encourage everyone who has interest uh, in learning more to attend the Ask the Twitter event uh, at that time on March 30th. And now I would like to turn over uh, the uh, Master of Ceremonies to Dr. Mark Ilgen, who will take us through the next part of our day. Dr. Ilgen is a clinical psychologist and health services researcher with an interest in improving outcomes for individuals with problematic alcohol or drug use. He is currently a research career scientist with the VA uh, for clinical management research in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. A core focus of Dr. Ilgen's work has been on understanding substance use as a risk factor for suicide and unintentional overdose, including ongoing work to test the efficacy of interventions to reduce suicide risk. Much of this work has been focused on preventing suicide among veteran populations. Currently, he is one of the co-directors of the VA's National Suicide Prevention Research Impact Network Consortia of Research. He is also the co-director of this summit with Dr. Cheryl King and a lead for suicide prevention in our center. He and Dr. King, who you will meet later today, have both been instrumental in developing today's event, and I would like to take this time to thank them for all their energy, effort, and expertise in developing today's agenda. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ilden. Thank you, Pat, and thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our first plenary speaker today, Dr. Craig Bryan. Dr. Bryan is a board-certified clinical psychologist in cognitive behavioral psychology. He is the Stress, Trauma, and Resilience, or STAR, professor of psychiatry and behavioral health at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and is the Division Director for Recovery and Resilience. Dr. Bryan has published over 200 scientific articles and multiple books, including Brief Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Suicide Prevention. For his contributions to mental health and suicide prevention, Dr. Bryan has received numerous awards and recognitions. It's truly an honor to have him here with us. As a reminder about the logistics for today, we pre-recorded all plenary sessions to limit technical difficulties, um, but we will have a, a live question and answer session at the end of these presentations. So please um, type any questions you have in the Q&A box, and I will uh, have the opportunity to ask those of Dr. Brian after his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian. Right, well, thanks for that introduction, Mark. It's good to be here. I appreciate you inviting me to spend a little bit of time talking today about an issue, a topic that I think has been on many of our minds uh, over the past year, and that's um, the, the relationship between uh, COVID-19 pandemic and suicide risk in the U.S. Um, and what I was hoping to do today was uh, kind of take a, a 30,000 foot view and really um, kind of think about what do the data show us thus far about suicide rates uh, during the past year and what might be the implications for us moving forward from a prevention perspective. So since the start of the COVID outbreak in the U.S. last year, there's obviously been a lot of discussion about the consequences of the pandemic on our collective mental health um, and suicide rates in particular. To date, this discussion has not been especially balanced, in my opinion, um, especially in public forums. And as, a sam as the sampling of headlines on the screen conveys right now, I would argue that the prevailing perspective when thinking about suicide rates during COVID has been the assumption that suicide rates will increase, um, whether that occurs during the pandemic itself or soon afterwards. Now, concerns about possible increases in suicide rates are based in large part on the presumed negative effects of the pandemic and consequential public health measures on a range of risk factors. Uh, so for instance, physical distancing measures, which are designed to help protect us from the spread or transmission of uh, the virus, um, including things like banning of large gatherings, um, staying socially distant, uh, canceling events, things like that could potentially increase social isolation. It could also reduce the availability of recreational activities, leisure activities, or other meaningful um, events and groups that would often serve as a protective factor against stress, mental illness, and suicide. There's of course economic effects that have uh, been identified 
Um, this can lead to financial strain. There's just concerns about loss of health coverage because at least in the United States, um, health insurance is tied to employment. So the pandemic basically in general could strengthen risk factors associated with suicide while also weakening or disrupting protective factors that would reduce risk. Then if we take all of those factors and lay over them, this sharp increase in firearm sales that has been observed in the past year. So firearm acquisition and ownership present an especially noteworthy concern because firearm availability can increase risk for suicide indefinitely, even well beyond the pandemic ends. Whereas a lot of those other risk factors that we talked about on the previous slide are arguably more situational or time limited in nature. Things like financial strain, job loss, disturbance in mood, um, social isolation should theoretically start to resolve as vaccinations increase and as the pandemic winds down. Once you own a firearm, however, that risk factor remains present and will continue. So characterizing the COVID-19 pandemic as the perfect storm, so to speak, therefore makes sense. What's interesting, though, is that the preliminary data that have come out in the past year suggests that maybe these concerns aren't quite as uh, dramatic as has often been presented and discussed. So consider, for example, uh, these recently published data uh, from the state of Massachusetts. In this study, Faust and colleagues analyzed temporal trends in suicide deaths and found that the suicide deaths in Massachusetts were actually lower than expected during the first few months of the pandemic, so about a year ago. Uh, Faust and colleagues then conducted a fairly conservative sensitivity analysis where they also looked at all of the, um, all of the deaths that were still pending a final adjudication. So it wasn't really certain if it was suicide or if it was something else. Um, what they found was that when they included all of those uncertain deaths, the results suggested that there was no change in the overall death rate um, or suicide rate during the first few months of the pandemic. So even when being overly cautious, that certainly did make the numbers seem not as promising, uh, but the overall conclusion was that there was no change as compared to previous years. So here's a separate study that many of you may have read as well, conducted by uh, Michael Bray and colleagues using data from uh, more, uh, or using mortality trends in the state of Maryland. And what they found, I, I think, was actually pretty compelling and it's something that's very noteworthy, which is that there were differences in the trends between Black residents and white residents of Maryland. Specifically, suicide mortality increased among Black residents in Maryland, whereas suicide mortality decreased amongst white residents. Now, when we kind of look at uh, these overall differences between these two groups, we see that the reductions in white residents are much larger in magnitude than the increase in uh, increase amongst black residents. And for these reasons, Maryland overall seems to be having a downward trend in suicides, even though there are some subgroups who maybe are experiencing an increase in vulnerability. So one of the most important conclusions, at least to me from this study, was that different subgroups may have different risk profiles. And so when we think about how COVID is impacting suicide rates, we may need to be much more sophisticated and nuanced about how we think about this, as opposed to simply talking about um, or speaking in these sort of general uh, sweeping generalities. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the work that my own team has conducted over the past year of looking at some of these issues as well. Now, in this study, which has been published in Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior, we looked at suicidal ideation and non-fatal suicide attempts as our outcomes rather than suicide deaths. So we're looking at the notion of suicide risk from a somewhat different perspective using different outcomes. And in this study, we collected data from over 10,000 U.S. adults 
who were recruited to match U.S. Census data. And one thing I will note is that we did not use probability-based sampling, and so we cannot conclude that any results based on this study um, are generalizable to U.S. adults as a whole. However, I still think that the data are important for testing some key hypotheses. Now, one of the other caveats, though, to keep in mind is that we did not originally design this study or this survey to consider the specific issue of suicide risk during COVID. Um, we actually designed the study for a completely different purpose to test completely separate hypotheses. Things were sort of keyed up, approved, ready to go before the pandemic started. And then uh, basically the, the, the survey was fielded right within the first month of uh, the first case in the United States. So in many ways, it was sort of just um, happenstance that we collected this data so early on in the pandemic. And so I think it is key to keep that in mind as I talk about some of uh, our findings, because, you know, obviously in retrospect, if we had sort of known that this pandemic was coming, um, that this issue would be of such great concern, we probably would have designed things um, in a very different way. One of the things that we did ask about in the survey was asking, in addition to recent suicidal thoughts and behaviors, uh, we asked about different life stressors that were occurring in a person's life. And specifically, we were saying, hey, what are some things that have happened within the past month that are stressing you out more than usual? So I'll just present here a highlight of some of what we found, because I do think that there are a couple of interesting uh, results that are worth uh, us talking about. But if you'd like a full accounting of all the methods and uh, the procedures that we use, again, this has been published in uh, Suicide Life Threatening Behavior, and you can pull up a copy there and read more about it. All right, so the first thing that I want to point out is that we use publicly available data to determine which of our participants completed the survey while they were subject to various public health measures. And so as a part of our survey, we were asking respondents to tell us, in essence, where is your current residence? Um, and we tied that to zip code so that we could then isolate and determine what state they were living in. We then pulled up at that time um, some publicly available information about uh, first large gatherings bans as well as stay at home orders that were being instituted at the state level so that we could start assessing whether respondents living in different states subject to different public health measures were reporting different levels of emotional distress, suicidal thoughts, and behaviors. And again, we collected this data in, I think it was like March to April of 2020. So at that time, there were still some states that were not instituting or rolling out uh, large-scale public health measures whereas others were sort of early adopters and had already put those in place at the time that these data were collected. So we did have this sort of naturally occurring situation where some respondents were experiencing some public health measures, whereas others were not. What we found was that overall, rates of probable depression, past month suicidal ideation, and past month suicide attempts largely did not differ across different respondents who were subject to these different public health measures. We also found that participants who were recently suicidal, who had thought about suicide, were actually less likely to have attempted suicide in the past month if they lived in a state that was subject to large gathering bans. So it's kind of interesting that we, first of all, did not support um, a lot of the concerns that maybe some of these physical distancing measures would actually make things worse in terms of mental health and suicide risk. And there's some data, um, although I don't want to put too much stock into it, suggesting that maybe in those locations there was a protective effect. I mentioned before that part of what we did in this survey was we asked respondents to identify different events or circumstances during the past month that was causing them to experience more stress than usual. And we presented them with a list of options. Um, again, we didn't know that the pandemic was coming at the time. Um, and so we didn't necessarily gear these items specific to infections and global um, outbreaks. But what we can see here is that the most commonly reported stress was just other unspecified events. So we, we don't really know what that is. Um, but the next 
clear, uh, most highly endorsed stressful event involved unexpected bills and expenses, so financial strain. That was reported by about 28% of the sample. Uh, then after that, the death of a close friend or family member was reported by uh, 22% of the sample. And then finally, a life-threatening illness or injury of a close family member uh, was third on the list and was reported by over one in six or 17% of the sample. So one of the next things that we did was we considered how is each life stressor correlated with recent suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts? Now, perhaps not surprisingly, relationship problems and legal problems were associated with significantly higher rates of suicidal ideation within the past month. Relationship problems were also correlated with higher rates of suicide attempts, but so is life-threatening illness and injury of a loved one. And then in a final analysis, what we did is we took of those respondents who in the past month reported suicidal ideation, we looked at were those who also attempted suicide reporting different types of stressors at different rates as compared to those who thought about suicide but did not attempt. And what we found was that Concerns or stress about the life-threatening illness or injury of a family member or friend was associated with a nearly fourfold increase in the likelihood of having attempted suicide. So respondents who were thinking about suicide recently uh, were significantly more likely to have also attempted suicide if they knew someone um, that they cared about who was struggling with a life-threatening illness or an injury. Now, aside from some of the limitations that I mentioned before, including, you know, we, we didn't plan for this to be um, a pandemic type of survey. We didn't know it was coming, so we didn't necessarily design um, our survey accordingly. We also have limitations um, related to the fact that this is, of course, cross-sectional data. Um, so it's really just a, sort of a snapshot in time. And then we look at the timeline of where, when these data were collected relative to the pandemic as a whole. Um, again, we were collecting the initial responses um, in March and April of 2020. And so it was in the very early stages of, of the pandemic where I think there was still a great deal of uncertainty about what was going to happen, how would things unfold, what, what's going, how long is this going to last, um, who's going to get infected, how lethal is it? Lots of questions were raging in all of our minds at that time. But another important caveat to keep in mind, whenever we think about or talk about how suicide risks might be affected by the pandemic is that at least here in the United States, the past year, isn't just about pandemic. There have actually been a host of social issues that have occurred that affect our nation, perhaps in a way that other nations have been impacted. And so for instance, uh, 2020 was also characterized by widespread protests about police brutality. Um, a lot of those protests were organized by the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And so we see a lot of racial tension um, as well as a lot of social unrest in general also occurring on top of the pandemic. And it, one could argue that this form of unrest also contributed to a great deal of uncertainty for lives as we were living them at the time, but also what does this or, or what does this portend for our nation and for the future? And then of course, Another social issue that has occurred in 2020 um, involved politics and political unrest. Um, so we had a very contentious presidential election year, um, which culminated uh, just within the past few months with an insurgency um, where um, a, a subgroup of individuals stormed uh, the Capitol building, um, create a lot of damage. And uh, we, we don't know exactly what else for sure uh, was on their minds. Um, but at any rate, what we can be sure of is that um, there's a lot of tension uh, related to political and social issues um, that, have e that has erupted into violence. And so we need to consider that as well. We can't distinguish or disentangle COVID from these other significant uh, social movements that have occurred. And so I highlight that because all of these issues fuel uncertainty about the future, 
They fuel anxiety about the unknown. And these, these forms of uncertainty and anxiety are often referred to as anticipatory anxiety. So anticipatory anxiety, or sort of like the fear of fear or fear of the unknown, has been shown to increase emotional and behavioral reactivity. And it also degrades cognitive control processes. These are neurocognitive vulnerability factors for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And so people who are worried about perceived threats, who are worried about the uncertainty of their future may be more likely to experience suicidal thoughts and behaviors in general. And so that could stem from COVID concerns, but also these other social political issues as well. Now, incidentally, I, I think this concern, this uncertainty, um, and this anxiety is also relevant for us understanding trends in firearm acquisition and how firearms may lend longer-term persisting risk for suicide that could reach beyond uh, the end of the pandemic. And so, for instance, this, this working model that uh, my team has been looking at seems to suggest that uh, the data collected over the years that firearm acquisition is often motivated by the fear of the unknown, this, this perception that the, that the world and people are dangerous um, it's not necessarily specific threats about specific forms of harm, but just this generalized, you can't trust other people, the world is not a safe place. And so firearms are often acquired as a coping strategy um, to help give a sense of empowerment amidst that, uh, that sense of perceived um, lack of control over the environment. All of this may inadvertently seem to fuel or reinforce that uncertainty such that acquisition of firearms, although it's intended to help cope with anxiety, may actually sustain and worsen anxiety over time, which then leads to this downstream effect where we start to see impact on decision-making processes, uh, cognitive control, emotion regulation, decision-making, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things that we know are correlated with increased risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And so what, what I think all of this means for us is that, you know, we can't really know for sure what the impact of COVID on suicide risk will be. We have some preliminary data, but I think even as time passes, you know, there's this sort of mindset that well, only time will tell. But because of these other social political factors that have affected us in the United States over the past year, I'm not so sure it's going to be very easy and straightforward to disentangle what is related to the pandemic and what's related to other social forces. I suppose it's possible we could look at trends and patterns within the United States and how they match or don't match trends in other nations around the world. But I think that's always going to be sort of the fly in the ointment that we'll have to contend with. So I think a couple of key implications warrant consideration um, for us researchers and for those of us invested in suicide prevention. The first of which is that I think it's important for us to keep in mind that stress and emotional strain caused by social conditions and pressures do not necessarily constitute mental illness or mental health disorders. So experiencing anxiety about one's health and the health of others during a global pandemic financial strain resulting from job loss or from declining economic stability, and uncertainty about the future and one's own safety and security all represent natural stress responses to the environment. So I think we need to be careful about over-pathologizing these natural reactions. And I think that's one thing that I worry about in our conversation over the past year is that everything's about depression, um, or anxiety disorders, rising mental health dis disorders or conditions, when in reality, it may be demoralization, and it might be understandable stress reactions to the environment. Second, we need to remember that some groups may experience increased strain and stress. They may also experience increased risk for suicide, but other groups may not. Working from home, for instance, may be a risk factor for some because that means that they no longer have a job or they're not earning as much income as before. 
For others, however, working from home may remove that person from a toxic or stressful work environment, particularly if they work with coworkers or peers who are unsupportive um, or who contribute to other risk within their lives. So related to that, I think we need to keep in mind that humans as a whole tend to be resilient, but individual differences are the rule. And so instead of thinking about suicide risk as the sort of monolithic um, issue that everyone's going to be subjected to, I think it's probably better for us to think about for whom might suicide risk worsen, but also for whom might suicide risk decline. And then finally, it seems clear as though the most appropriate treatments or interventions for suicide prevention um, that I, I think are indicated over the course of the past year are not actually mental health or medical in nature. But what I mean by that is medication and therapy won't get someone their job back. It won't increase the size of their paycheck. It's not going to speed up how soon they get a vaccine. So these mental health and medically oriented approaches, which are sort of the bread and butter of suicide prevention, aren't really going to address the core issues that might actually be contributing to increase in suicide risk if that's actually happening for some people. These strategies, mental health treatments, can certainly help take the edge off, assuming people can afford to access uh, these services. Um, but I think we need to really be focusing on and emphasizing the importance of social treatments, looking at finding ways to stabilize um, people's financial security, passing economic relief packages, expanding health care access, making sure that people have an idea of when, or, when am I actually going to be able to get a vaccine, uh, but also consistent messaging from civic and government leaders, right? Because part of the issue is that when we get conflicting messages and different people telling us different things and information changes, it creates those conditions whereby people start losing faith and confidence in others and that uncertainty and anticipatory anxiety increase. So being able to lay out specifics, providing more sense of structure um, at a national level could actually go a lot further in helping to mitigate risk against suicide. And I think would ultimately be way more impactful than trying to get everybody into therapy or helping them to start medications. And so um, I, I think that's where I want to conclude. Um, I put up my email address here in case anyone has some thoughts or questions would like to reach me afterwards. But in the meantime, I'm open um, to any questions. Look forward to any conversation or discussion that you might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dr. Brian, for a great presentation and for all your work on suicide prevention. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. And uh, just as a, a general uh, bit of housekeeping, I know that several questions have come in related to uh, the availability of these presentations and accessing the presentations over time. And just to remind the group, uh, all the slides will be available as, as well as the recorded presentations on the Injury Prevention Center's website for several weeks after today. So if there's anything that you're wondering about or you wanna go back and, and rewatch or um, hear again, you can always go back to the website. So um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. And I, and I wanna get um, use this as an opportunity just to um, give Dr. Brian a chance to provide a little more context. Uh, Craig, I really appreciated your presentation as a way to frame kind of a balanced approach to thinking about issues related to, to suicide within the context of COVID. On one hand, wanting to be vigilant and um, acknowledge the increase in a lot of stressors that have traditionally, at least on the surface, sounded like they're linked to suicide, but also trying not to overly um, pathologize the, you know, what's going on and the fact that everyone is experiencing stress and, and may all respond to that differently. And so, um, you know, within that context, as the pandemic continues, what sort of steps do you think would be helpful to mitigate uh, 
um, suicide risk within our community. Sure. So, so thanks, Mark, for um, the introduction and for helping to facilitate the Q um, and A. You know, I, I, I remember, gosh, it's been almost exactly a year um, since the shutdowns began, and um, I, I, I even remember a, a year ago, I was actually in Boston and was flying to Ohio for my job interview here at Ohio State, and that was like everything started closing, and it was really kind of eerie. It was a ghost town. Um, and I remember in those early weeks, there was a lot of anxiety um, about what's going to happen. What does this mean? You know, I, I think all of us, to some extent, were worried about, am I going to become infected? Um, will someone else in my family, um, you know, catch the, the virus? Um, and so I, I think it, all of that sort of subjective experience, which is, again, completely natural, I think really kind of lent many of us to um, really start to you know, catastrophize in that sense that the conditions were right. Um, and I think mental health advocates and suicide preventions had this sense of, oh no, here's this sort of looming um, second pandemic or this other catastrophe that might occur. And I, I, I just remember kind of reflecting upon that and thinking about other research, especially the work of Thomas Joyner, um, who, you know, has really kind of looked at suicide rates as it relates to sort of national calamity, um, crises, things like that. And uh, there's some decent data suggesting that during natural disasters and these big sort of social um, crises that suicide rates decline. Um, and, and he's hypothesized that it um, creates sort of a, a, a coming together um, a, a bonding, a banding um, against sort of a common enemy or a common um, threat, so to speak. And, um, and and I do remember a year ago, there was, I think, to an extent, that sense of we're all in this together. Um, and, and so that was really early on where I started kind of thinking about this. Well, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not going to be as bad as we think. And perhaps this sort of social experience um, in some cases could um, maybe have, uh, you know, kind of a reduction of risk, especially I was thinking of like kids um, and even adults who are now removed from perhaps stressful environments where they're, you know, surrounded by people who are bullying them, abusing them, you know, work-related stress. Um, and I think it, it just was easy for us to kind of forget about that aspect of things, uh, because all of us were caught up in that additional anxiety. Um, and so, again, you know, like I said, the presentation, time will tell, so to speak, um, but the data do seem to suggest that perhaps consistent with other uh, national crises and calamities, it, it seems like on the whole, uh, suicide risk is dropping, although there are some subgroups for whom things might actually be getting worse. Great. And with that as a context, what do you think um, are some takeaway messages for policymakers? What are the policy implications of work like this? Yeah, I, I really think um, there there are a, a few things. And, you know, again, we, we tend to, I think, have this um, bias, uh, particularly in the suicide prevention community, to really look at sort of individual risk um, as if suicide is Suicide risk is within the person, and so we need to offer them treatments or interventions to, you know, kind of reduce that risk or, you know, magnify or strengthen protective factors. Um, but what I think really stands out here is the social strain, and so, you know, civic leaders, policymakers, I think, I, I would argue, have the potential to have a much more profound effect on suicide prevention right now than those of us who are mental health professionals and healthcare providers. Um, and I, I think it is, you know, being able to provide reassurance, consistent messages, um, sort of like wherever possible deadlines. I, I think, you know, it's going to happen by this date. We're going to do X, you know, in a week where it provides, I think, people a little bit of certainty um, amidst uncertainty. Um, and I think we can also look at what we, what we do at, um, you know, a societal level related to helping people to pay their mortgage, to pay rent, uh, to put food on the table, to take care of their families. 
those are the things that are going to reduce all of this emotional distress and serve as a protective factor. And again, um, individual healthcare providers really aren't in a position to do that. Um, but government leaders um, and our communities as a whole, the decisions we make there can have profound effects on risk. Great. And maybe then to go to the other end of the spectrum, um, we've had a number of questions coming in about individual risk factors uh, for suicide. And um, in looking at the questions, I, I think some people are struggling with trying to understand if someone they know or care about might be at risk and feeling like that might be even harder during periods like this where everything feels uh, more intense and it's a little harder to, um, to understand kind of normative reactions to stress versus someone who might be really struggling and in need of extra help. So can you provide just a little bit of, of information about what sorts of things people could be looking for as risk factors for suicide? Sure. So, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, what, what I'm sort of hearing that question, one of the, the limitations that many of us have found ourselves in is that in some cases, a lot of our typical you know, coping strategies, leisure activities, the things that we would do to de-stress are not readily available, you know. Um, if, you know, in suicide prevention, we talk a lot about the importance of social support and, you know, like we'll go spend time with friends, go out to a movie, things like that. And right now that's just not possible for us. Um, and it hasn't been uh, for a long time. And so I do think that we, we find ourselves a little bit more constrained and boxed in. Um, and so what I've found to be, I, I think, really helpful at an individual level then is a lot of the research that we're doing now um, suggests that um, we're, we're starting to look beyond some of the classic risk factors like hopelessness and depression and suicidal ideation. And we're starting to find that um, there, there's sort of a broader range of thought processes that seem to be fairly solid indicators of risk, things like I can't take this anymore. Um, you know, I, I, I can never be forgiven for the things that I've done. People would be better off without me. Um, and I, I've often referred to this as like the coded language of suicide where someone isn't saying the S word. Um, it, it's not sort of explicitly suicidal, uh, but it's, it's very clear indication that things are not going well, that they feel you know, like they're, they're kind of being pushed to the breaking point. Um, and I really encourage family members, um, friends, coworkers, everyone to be in tune to those comments. And if you hear people saying those things, maybe they're posting it online, um, that's usually a pretty reliable indicator that things are not going well for them. Um, and that's where being able to reach out to them, text messaging, uh, social media, um, Zoom, like here, um, we, we do, at least I'm, I'm glad and grateful for the time that we live in and that we have technologies and resources available to us that, you know, heck, even when I was growing up, not that, you know, just a couple decades ago, this wasn't possible. Um, and so I would say the last point then is, as we think about helping each other out is, um, I, I really think kind of keeping in the back of our minds as well, sort of a flexible mindset um, and recognizing that although things may not be the way that we would prefer, um, the strategies that we would normally employ to help others might not be available to us. How can we sort of think on our feet? Um, how can we adapt to the situation? Um, and we can, we can reach out and support each other, even in ways that maybe wouldn't be at the top of our list uh, for preferred strategies, but they're still good strategies nonetheless. Looking for those approaches that are good enough to really make a difference and, and maybe yeah. turn the tide. I'm, I'm very much, I'm a big fan of the good enough mindset um, where it's sort of like, you know, at a certain point we hit a threshold and maybe maybe certain things are better than others above that threshold, but it's, it's sort of like we just need to um, be there for each other just enough, have just good enough technology, just good enough ways of connecting with each other. Um, and I think we'll overall be okay. Wonderful. And um, maybe as a final question, you mentioned firearms in your talk and the um, increase in firearm sales. And several questions have come in about uh, firearms, both at the policy level and at the individual level. 
Can you talk a little bit about what you think um, the, the policy implications might be or what policy level interventions? And then also just even for someone who has a person they care about that they know is a firearm owner and, and may be at risk for suicide, um, you know, what types of strategies um, might be useful to start that conversation? Sure. I'm, I'm going to start with the, the second uh, question there about the individual level. Um, we, you know, actually, Mike Anessis and I have just published a paper within the past few months showing that a 15 to 20 minute conversation with a gun owner can significantly increase their willingness to lock up uh, their guns using gun safes, gun locks. And um, there's some data, epidemiological data, showing that those safe storage practices can actually reduce um, rates of suicide and especially firearm suicide. And so it, it's something we're continuing to work on, but sometimes it's just very simple, straightforward conversations on um, sitting down and saying, let's talk about um, how you store your weapons, especially during times of crisis um, and times of stress. Um, because uh, the metaphor that I found really helpful is in the same way that, you know, when we get into a car to drive, we buckle our seatbelt every single time because we often don't know when we're going to get into a car accident. And so it's sort of like you don't want to wait until someone is smashed into you or your car is spinning around in circles to say, oh, I should buckle up my seatbelt right now. Um, there's not a, lot, not a lot of time for that to work. And I think it's the same with guns. We can buckle up our guns um, to, to be potentially life-saving in an unexpected crisis. Um, then at a policy level, I think I, I would say that we, we're kind of stuck in some ways where we think about legislative solutions that restrict access to firearms. And there is data suggesting that can be helpful. Um, but I, I'm really interested in thinking more flexibly um, at a policy level where we could incentivize um, people engaging in the desired behaviors like we've done with many, many other um, public health injury related issues. And so um, what I mean by that is how do we incentivize people purchasing and using you know, gun safes, gun locks, uh, things like that. How do we um, how do we work with like insurance companies? I mean, th think of home insurance, car insurance, things like that, where we get asked questions like, "Yeah, do you have airbags? Do you have um, an alarm system? Do you have these safety features? And if so, you get a discount, you know, in your in premiums." And maybe there's something similar we could do at a policy level there to provide these economic incentives to encourage people to engage in safer behaviors that don't necessarily require um, some of the more stringent uh, restriction-related um, approaches. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are actually out of time and at the point where, where we pivot to uh, our next plenary speaker. So thank you, Dr. Bryan, for a thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation.